Uh, next up is a good friend of mine, Seth Gruber. Seth Gruber is a pro-life ninja apologist. If you've never heard Seth talk before, uh, hopefully you have a seat belt in your seats and you guys can uh, get seated and grounded. He, he, he's a borderline genius. I've never met a Christian guy that reminds me of Rain Man. I tell people all the time, Seth has the, the, the uncanny ability to remember things. I think he said when he was a young man, he re remembered entire books of the Bible, am I right? Chapters? He's shaking his head. He doesn't want me to talk about this. He's a beloved brother, and God has used Seth single-handedly um, in, in accordance with the church, but he's used Seth to really rally and activate the church uh, in California and really across the nation. And so Seth is married to Olivia, has two children. He's actually a member of this church, even though they don't do membership here, right? So you know what that means. But he is, a, he is an active participant of this church. Seth has, uh, he speaks nationally all across uh, America to schools, to churches, to highlight the tragedy of abortion and then help activate them uh, and call them into the battle. So let's give it up for Seth Gruber. Good morning. How's it going? You all look beautiful. It's a beautiful morning, isn't it? Uh, and what a wonderful gathering of people, thinkers, uh, this church and the people here just so committed to the life of the mind, which if you haven't noticed is sort of a problem right now in the church, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, right? Mind. And we've abandoned the life of the mind in the church, and I think we're seeing the consequences of that. Uh, with wokeism, critical race theory, abortion, whatever you want to call it, uh, there's the, the, the pulpits have been abandoning the life of the mind. But it's such a rich and exciting journey, because all truth is God's truth. <laughs> Anywhere there's truth, capital T, it's God's truth. The Bible doesn't have to specifically say, critical race theory is bad and don't abort babies. For us to know that these things are bad, the Bible provides a spiritual basis and theological worldview for us to establish spiritual clarity on a whole range of moral questions. And that's what today is about, confronting the culture, taking back spiritual ground that the enemy has fortified, because guess what? We already win in the end. But in the meantime, we're going to take ground because that's part of loving neighbor. Confronting the culture is simply loving neighbor. The neighbors who are the victims of bad ideas, the neighbors who are the victims of forceps when they're lynched in the womb. The neighbors who are the victims of transgender ideologies, which chop off the genitalia of eight-year-old boys because they played with a Sally doll once, and their school teacher said, I guess you're a girl now. Uh, part of confronting the culture is simply obeying that second greatest commandment, to love your neighbor. And I would submit to you this morning, brothers and sisters, that the unborn child is the only neighbor that it's legal to kill. So when you talk about all of these dominant moral issues of our day, amen, they're all important. But while many issues are important, they don't all carry the same moral weight. We are lynching over a million babies a year in the womb in this country. And yet, we have woke pastors, or I call them appease the culture Christians, who espouse pro-life ideas. They pay lip service to pro-life ideas, but then when the rallying cry comes and the trumpet is blown and we're saying, help us hit the field of battle to end abortion and protect God's children, they fold like a cheap suit. One of the reasons we have so much cowardice in the church today is because the institutions that the future generation of Christian leaders are being educated at are full of cowards. They're full of what C.S. Lewis called men without chests. C.S. Lewis once beautifully described sort of this abandonment of the life of the mind and the problem in academia and higher ed thinking where suddenly the smartest people are the dumbest. Amen? Do you know what I mean? And C.S. Lewis says, and, and I don't want to transition to a point here, and I, I think you'll see the connection. It's, it's, it's powerful. I mean, you talk about C.S. Lewis, a cultural prophet. He said, these people, they simply found themselves in contact with a certain current of ideas, and they plunged into it because it seemed modern and successful. You know, they just started automatically writing the kind of essays that got good marks and saying the kind of things that won applause. They were afraid of a breach with the spirit of the age, afraid of ridicule having allowed themselves to drift, unresisting, accepting every half-conscious solicitation from their desires, they reached a point where they no longer believed the truth. And this is what has happened to so much of Christian academia 
and evangelicalism today is that the people who are educating the next generation of Christians have reached a point where they no longer believe the truth. And Professor Owen can talk about that as a Christian academic who is a man with a chest, by the way. Wasn't that an incredible talk? <laughs> Beautiful. But we all see the problems in Christian higher education, don't we? I know this because I went to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, one of the wokest, most progressive, flaming piles of, you know, fill in the <laughs> euphemism, universities in America. Dr. Gail Beebe, the president of Westmont College, is the perfect description of a man without a chest. I got there as a freshman thinking that like, oh, Christians are all pro-life, right? How naive I was. I started the first pro-life club that had ever been at Westmont College. Took me a full semester to find a faculty advisor. Because you have to to get your club approved, right? And I was very disliked on campus. And then I realized, oh my gosh, my college hires pro-abortion professors. I'm like, what the heck? Because I, I can prove it. I have email debates with them. I'll put it in a book one day and, and cite the emails and you'll, you know, but I'm telling you first. And, and I'm like, you're, what? And these people say, oh, Seth, you know, it's a big tent faith. It's a big tent faith, Christianity. We need to make room for all these ideas within the church. And so I once received an email from my faculty advisor, brave, wonderful man with a chest, and he had been included in an email thread with other professors who were all getting high off their own intellectual flatulence, if you will. And they were talking about how frustrated they were with the recent speaker in chapel. Believe it or not, Westmont at the time actually did have a pro-life speaker in chapel. I, as an alumni, will never be invited back to speak in that chapel, unless, like, I don't know, Rob McCoy becomes the president of the university or something like that. <clears throat> and uh, all these professors were upset about this pro-life message. You know, it was, it was too black and white. And we as Christians, we need to live in, in the gray area, you know. And so he forwards me this message from one of those professors who I actually had a couple years ago, and he's like, Seth, check this out. Is this not so indicative of Christian higher academia? Here's what this professor said. He said, the moral particularities of abortion are so fine textured and open textured that Manichaean distinctions about being pro or anti-abortion strike me as ethically obtuse. Our community and our students are best served when our chapel speakers invite us to tarry in the liminal spaces of complexity. Now, I don't know what that means either. And I wish I could tell you that that was just a parody of professorial thinking, but that was actually a window into our culture's deep-seated confusion on moral issues from appease the culture men without chest Christians who fold like a cheap suit at the moment that they're needed the most. So if you're wondering why, Tim Keller, Ed Stetzer, Rick Warren, Russell Moore, shall I go on? Um, are sort of, I don't know, some breed between Christian and Marxist and Karl Marx, I'm not really sure. It's because the institutions where these people are getting educated at are, are, have professors like the one I just quoted to you. And this is what we're facing. So these are not just kooky professors at Christian universities, but these ideas are coming from major Christian pastors and leaders who should be confronting the culture of death as shepherds to help abolish abortion. But instead, they're creating confusion amongst our troops and almost literally telling us to run and hide to simply appease the culture of death. And unfortunately, Pastor Tim Keller is sort of the best example of this. People are like, Seth, you're so divisive. Why do you go after these Christian figures? Um, because part of loving neighbor is calling out bad ideas so that people don't become victims of these bad ideas. This is also called syncretism, by the way. Syncretism is when you attach pagan ideologies to your faith, but you still masquerade it as orthodoxy. <laughs> okay? And Bonhoeffer had some real pow powerful words against German syncretists, by the way, too. Romans 13, they were just obeying the governing authorities by preaching Nazi bigotry from their pulpits. So Tim Keller put a uh, post on Facebook in September of 2020. And this was really when I became aware of the wolf that he was, the wolf in sheep's clothing that he was. Professor Owen and Vody and others, they've been contending for the faith in the public square for a lot longer than I have, and they've been aware of these very dangerous, compromised individuals. But I only became aware of it truly with Pastor Keller in 2020. So in September 2020, two months before the national election, right, here's what he says on Facebook. He says, the Bible tells me that abortion is a sin and a great evil. Okay, paying lip service. But it doesn't tell me the best way to decrease or end abortions in this country or which policies are most effective. This means when it comes to voting, taking political positions, and determining political alliances, the Christian has liberty of conscience. Christians cannot say to other Christians, every Christian must vote for this person, or no Christian can vote for this person, end quote. Pastor Tim Keller. 
Liberty of conscience, what does that mean? God doesn't care about your vote, that's what that means. You have liberty of conscience to follow it wherever it leads you in voting for Hillary Clinton, the most pro-abortion political politician in American history, who's best friends with Cecile Richards, the former president of Planned Parenthood, who lynches more black people in the womb every two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. You can vote for Hillary Clinton and be a Christian, just follow your conscience. That's what Tim Keller says. So according to Keller's reasoning, supporting the Democrat Party of the 1850s, the party of the KKK, was acceptable, right? Because you know the Bible doesn't tell us which policies are most effective at decreasing or ending slavery. According to Keller, supporting Hitler and his regime was acceptable for German Christians because those German Christians, they had liberty of conscience too to support politicians with a genocidal agenda. Now, if Pastor Tim Keller rejects these suggestions as permissible for the Christian, which I guarantee you he does, but he is indeed pro-life, then his own argument is rendered false. Why? Because abortion, slavery, and the Holocaust are all wrong for the same reasons. In each circumstance, the government denied rights of personhood to image bearers of God while dehumanizing them in order to justify their mistreatment. So you would think, well, Seth, well, if Pastor Keller then uh, would, would uh, oppose Christians remaining politically neutral on slavery and the Holocaust, well, surely he would oppose Christians being politically neutral on abortion because they're all wrong for the same reasons. So doesn't the unborn deserve the same political solutions and the restoration of personhood and the protections therein as he demands for the black man and the Jew? No, which is why he wrote a New York Times opinion editorial in 2018 called How Do Christians Fit Into a Two-Party System? They Don't. Now, the title of the article is fine. You're right, Christians don't fit perfectly into a two-party system. We're not citizens of this world. We're passing through. I get it. Jesus is not a Republican or a Democrat. I get it. It's fine. But he starts with that premise, and then he, he starts blasting Christians in the 1850s who were politically neutral on the issue of slavery. Here's what he says. Christians cannot pretend they can transcend politics and simply preach the gospel. Those who avoid all political discussions and engagement are essentially casting a vote for the social status quo. American churches in the early 19th century that did not speak out against slavery because that was what we would now call getting political were actually supporting slavery by doing so. To not be political is to be political. End quote. Yes. Oh, it sounds like Bonhoeffer. Silas in the face of evil is itself evil. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. It sounds like Ellie Weisel, the Holocaust survivor and the author of the book Night. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. But he doesn't apply the same political solutions to the pre-born, which tells me, listen, Pastor Tim Keller and these pastors are bigots. Oh, Seth, you went too far. I'm tuning out of your message now. What's bigotry? Discriminating against someone else for being different, especially if those differences are based on immutable characteristics. Immutable characteristics are things you have no control over, like your skin color or gender. Like the preborn has no control over the fact that they're smaller, less developed, and more dependent on the very human being who created them. So according to Pastor Tim Keller, you were sinning through political neutrality in 1850 on the question of slavery. Right? To, to not be political is to be political, and when you pretended not to be, you were supporting the social status quo, which was slavery. So question, brothers and sisters, if political neutrality made you involved in supporting slavery, then wouldn't voting for Democrats in the 1850 make you more involved in slavery? Oh, duh. That was the party of the KKK. That was the party of not all humans or persons. That was the party responsible for slavery. The GOP, the grand old party, was launched to end slavery. But according to Pastor Tim Keller, not only is political neutrality today acceptable, but you have liberty of conscience to vote for Hillary Clinton and the pro-abortion Democrats who lynch your black and white neighbors in the womb because God doesn't care about your vote. So apparently the blood of unborn children doesn't run deep enough or hot enough to warrant the political intervention of Pastor Tim Keller and his other woke colleagues. This is why I call it soft bigotry because the born black man is intrinsically valuable enough to Pastor Tim Keller to protect. But the unborn black and white people, they're not intrinsically valuable enough to warrant the political intervention of the shepherds wearing wolf's clothing. So confronting the culture is not the calling of some Christians, brothers and sisters. It's not a special calling for the bold and courageous. Confronting the culture is simply stated in Christianity. When you live your life in obedience to Christ in the scriptures, you will necessarily, by definition, be confronting culture. However, I do believe that abortion 
and our tolerance of this great evil as the church functions as a sort of spiritual litmus test for the church. If Christians tolerate and make peace with abortion, we will likely tolerate and appease every other manifestation of evil in this post-Christian, post-truth culture. Just like slavery was the litmus test of the republic and the church in 1850, so is it today. So to end abortion, we must do two things. We must confront the lies of the appease the culture crowd, and we must also learn how to confront the culture of death ourselves. Does that make sense? We've got to call lies lies, right? That's what Professor Owen talked about. But we also need to contend for the truth and contend against this culture of death. So I want to go over three lies from the appease the culture crowd, shall we? Let's just debunk these because they're very popular. Ironically, they always get, tr they always get brought back out right before an election, right? Because these, these woke leftist Christians do all that they can to siphon votes away from the only political party reasonably situated to protect the pre-born in the first place. Seth, are you saying the GOP is the Christian party? No, I'm saying it's an imperfect fallen party, but it provides the only political solution to actually end abortion in the first place. Here's the first lie from the appease the culture crowd, okay? Only Jesus can change people's hearts. So just preach the gospel and abortion will end. And you see this meme sometimes right before elections. It says, it says want to end abortion? Preach the gospel. And you hear this a lot. It's like, okay, okay abortion's sin, they say, right? Abortion's sin. Okay, so it's a sin problem. What's the solution to sin? Well, the gospel. So stop getting so political. Just preach the gospel. You see, because when people get saved, they'll stop aborting their children. They won't have abortions anymore. Oh, oh, sorry about that statistic that 30% of women who get abortions report having attended church on a weekly basis. Uh, uh, shh. But just preach the gospel and abortion will naturally solve itself. Have you heard things like this? Too bad that didn't work for George Whitfield. Many people are not aware of this, but George Whitfield, of course, was arguably the greatest evangelist and preacher in the history of the world. Millions heard his preaching and converted. Some think he was almost single-handedly responsible um, for this American Republic through his revival preaching tour on the East Coast, and yet he defended chattel slavery until his death. He defended it, he insisted blacks had a lesser moral status than whites and that slavery was good for them. So if preaching the gospel is sufficient to fix a broken moral compass, why didn't it work for George Whitfield, arguably the greatest evangelist in the history of the world? Just preaching the gospel didn't adequately inform his worldview, did it? But that's what these appease the culture people say. If you just preach the gospel, these problems will just go away. Imagine saying, Christians shouldn't have gotten political to ban slavery. They should have just preached the gospel to plantation owners. Stop trying to pass laws to protect the black man. Just like witness to the plantation owners and those involved in the slave trade, and maybe they'll stop. Let's apply this to a, uh, a parable in scripture, and let's see how asinine this idea is. The good Samaritan is walking by on the side of the road, and he sees a bleeding victim, half dead, bleeding out on the side of the road. He walks up to him, and he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is near, and he leaves him there. <laughs> no, stop laughing. It's true. Don't confront injustice. Just preach the gospel, and it'll just all go away. Oh, but the, the unborn is literally bleeding out from their shoulders, Seth, because their limbs are being ripped off their body by paid hitmen. Yeah, just preach the gospel to them. Disgusting when you actually translate their euphemistic bigotry into reality. That's the first lie of the appease the culture crowd. <laughs> the second lie is actually more, it's a little bit more sneaky because it, like most propaganda, it has a kernel of truth, right? So you guys are familiar with the famous Anthony Breitbart line, politics is downstream of culture? So they say politics is downstream of culture, so rather than engaging politically, Christians should engage at the cultural level by preaching the gospel, engaging their communities through ministries of mercy, you know, just hands and feet, fleshy Christian love. Don't get political, just engage at the cultural level. Now, this has a kernel of truth. Of course, politics is downstream of culture, right? The, the, the nature of your culture will dictate the kind of politics that you get. But that's also a two-way street. Politics is downstream of culture, but culture is also downstream of politics. It goes both ways, and Christians fail to realize this. What are some examples of this? Abortion is an example of this. Do you want to know the median annual average of abortions in America pre-Roe versus Wade? About 98,000. That was the median, 98,000 a year, illegal abortions in America. Anyone want to know the annual totals by 73, 74? 1.5 million. Oh, that's an example of politics impacting culture. Uh, what about no-fault divorce laws? Did we get more or less divorce after no-fault divorce laws? More! Oh, that's an example of politics impacting culture. Last example, East and West Germany. East Germany is mostly, mostly atheist today. Did you know that? Over 50% of East Germans 
say that they are completely atheist. But only 10% of West Germans are atheists. So does culture explain this? As Michael Knoll says, is it because of like regional variations in bratwursts that you have a huge disparity in religiosity? I'm so confused here. No, the, the explanation is not cultural, it's political. Because the East German government was dominated by the officially atheistic Soviet Union for decades that pursued a ruthless policy of stamping out Christianity. And that had cultural effects even after the East Germany government went away. Okay, so some examples of how politics impacts culture. By the way, we get this from Aristotle. Aristotle said statecraft is soulcraft. What does he mean by that, statecraft? Politics. Statecraft is soulcraft. So government, through its laws and policies, prescribe which kind of behaviors are acceptable and not acceptable in a civilized society. Law functions as a teacher. So when you say the pre-born is an insensate blob of Untermensch, to quote the Nazi, subhuman, blob of tissue, no, no rights, and then the law teaches that to the next generation for the last 49 years, do you think that has a cultural impact? Yes, children for generations are born into a country that tells them that abortion is a fundamental blessing of liberty and you have to support it if you support women. Yes, that has cultural impacts. So it's very important to contend politically against the culture of death because law functions as a teacher and it also impacts the culture and that's a way to love neighbor because you know what the best way would be to love the unborn neighbor? Um, hmm. Oh, I know, stop killing them. If it was legal to lynch six foot three white men, while I would appreciate you, you know, raising money to support my family if I was lynched, you know, you know what I would, I kind of like you to do more actually? Make it illegal to kill me. Pass laws to protect me so I'm not afraid of living my life. The most important way to love preborn image bearers is to make it illegal to kill preborn image bearers. How do you do that? Culture? No, you do that through politics. So that's the, that's the second lie. Here's the third lie. Political engagement compromises my Christian witness. Uh, you see, guys, the reason I don't get political is because I love Jesus so much. So for those of you who get political, you're bad Christians. You're compromising your Christian witness by associating it with a certain political party. Now, who heard this in 2020 leading up to the election? <laughs> right? Remember the pro-life? Or it was worse. It was the pro-life evangelicals for Biden group who said it's because I love Jesus so much that I'm campaigning for Joe Biden. But there's this squishy middle who say, actually, because I'm such a good Christian and I want to protect the purity of my Christian witness in the public square, I can't vote for any politician because if I associate it with any political party, it dirties the gospel. So any association with Christianity with a political party tarnishes the gospel and because it turns people away from hearing the gospel that they otherwise would have heard had you not gotten political. We all heard this in 2020, right? So that's the third lie. Tim Keller actually takes us a step further. Tim Keller has always hated any association with Christianity with any political party. But he actually goes further. He believes that it's a really good thing to never even say the word abortion from the pulpit. Why? To protect his Christian witness. So he takes it a step further. Any issue that's perceived as political, actually, no, 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 any issue that's perceived as conservatively political, because Tim Keller goes all woke on critical race theory and systemic racism and black men just being shot down in the street, and, and that we participate in systems of oppression by dint of our skin color, Caucasians. So Tim Keller's happy to get political when it's left-wing political issues, but not right-wing political issues, which should tell you kind of what God he actually serves, but that's a sermon for another time. Okay, so he hates any conservative Christian association with a political party. Let me be a little bit more clear. And he actually, by the way, I've done, sermon archive searching, you can try this, Tim Keller abortion sermon. Try to find a sermon from Tim Keller. I haven't found one. I've, I've been searching for a long time. I don't think it exists. But in my searching, I found this one thing where he articulated in an article why he's a still silent shepherd on the genocide of his sheep. And here's what he said. He said, we will be careful with the order in which we communicate the parts of the faith. Pushing moral behaviors before we lift up Christ is religion. A woman who had been attending our church for several months came to see me. Do you think abortion is wrong, she asked. I said that I did. I'm coming now to see that maybe there is something wrong with it, she said. Now that I have become a Christian here and have started studying the faith in the classes. As we spoke, I, Tim Keller, discovered that she was an Ivy League graduate, a lawyer, a longtime Manhattan resident, and an active member of the ACLU. She volunteered that she had experienced three abortions. Now pause. Notice how Pastor Tim Keller describes abortion. Does he say she volunteered that she killed three of her children? Did she say she, that she volunteered that she paid for three abortions on her children? No, she says she experienced three abortions. 
Language is very important, and when the left or squishy Christians describe abortion, pay attention with the language that they use. She didn't experience three abortions. The babies experienced three abortions because abortion is the intentional killing of unborn children, and the birth canal is simply in the way of performing the abortion on the child. So I think she experienced three abortions? Really, Tim? Then she said, I want you to know that if I had seen any literature or reference to the pro-life movement, I would have not stayed through the first service. But I did stay, and I found faith in Christ. If abortion is wrong, you should certainly speak out against it, but I'm glad about the order in which you do it. End quote. That's Pastor Tim Keller's defense as to why he will not say the word abortion from the pulpit. Why? Because of his Christian public witness. Had she seen pro-life in the church of the foyer, she would have never come back. Oh, Tim, so you have to contrive the spiritual climate in which truth is spoken and people are brought to repentance. Rather than preaching truth and love and leaving the results to God and the conviction to the Holy Spirit. No, you see, Tim Keller is the Holy Spirit, folks. And he has to contrive the spiritual climate in which people are brought to repentance because, you see, if he goes out of his way to say truthful stuff, statements in a way that might be perceived as political, then the pagan ACLU attorney volunteer won't come back to the church and will never hear the gospel. So it's Tim Keller who's personally responsible for the gospel. According to Pastor Tim Keller, clerical silence or political neutrality in the face of child sacrifice is an acceptable means of evangelism. That's the best way to be an evangelist, is to stay silent on the genocide and sacrifice of children to Moloch because you care so much about your Christian witness, right guys? Anyone feel like throwing up? Of course, this silence is actually deafeningly loud, isn't it? Remember he said to not be political is to be political? Yes, Tim, your silence is permission. Your silence is complicity. And brothers and sisters, I, I, I wondered whether I should say this statement or not, but I think I need to. I shudder to think about how many women who attend Tim Keller's church have killed their children because his silence communicated that God just doesn't care about the issue that much. And as someone who grew up in the pro-life movement and has been doing this for a long time, I speak to women and men all the time who blame, well, no, we're personally responsible for our sin. But they, they explain how their church's silence on abortion played a decisive role in their decision to get an abortion. I talked to many women who said, oh my gosh, I would have never gotten an abortion had I been hearing pro-life preaching from the pulpit and the help of the church and the hope of the gospel for those considering abortion. Your silence is complicity and your silence is permission, Tim protect the purity of the gospel by remaining silent, you're compromising the purity of the gospel through your silence and your bigotry. One of my friends texted me on November 1st when I preached here in 2020, two days before the national election, and he was saying he, he wasn't going to vote for Trump. He said he couldn't do it. And, and he, you know what he said? He said, it's because, quote, I care so much about my witness, Seth. Hmm. To which I said, no, you only care about your Christian witness to your pagan San Francisco Bay Area leftist friends. What did I mean by that? Do we compromise our witness through our silence on abortion? Oh yeah, you bet. Do you know how many theists and agnostics there are who are not Christians but are pro-life because they still function off a, Ju a Judeo-Christian worldview that they're borrowing from Christianity and they don't want to have anything to do with the Church of Christ? Why? Because of the Church's silence on what they understand to be a genocide. So you're compromising your witness to those people who are not Christians but they're still functioning off of a theistic worldview and they don't want to have anything to do with your gospel because your silence has compromised your witness. Oh, it's almost as if we shouldn't be obsessed with our witness. We should be obsessed with obedience to Christ, righteousness, speaking truth in the public square, leaving the results to God and watching what he'll do when we're faithful. It's almost as if witness is an idol to justify your apathy, your cowardice, and your silence. I think that's what we're really facing, but I don't feel too strongly about it. <laughs> Francis Schaeffer actually put this better than I ever could when he said that if the church can't speak out against something as evil as killing a baby, then the world has the right to ask whether Christ is real. Well, you've just compromised your witness to the pagan society who's pro-life and doesn't want to have anything to do with your cowardly Christianity. Those are the three lies from the appease the culture crowd. Now that you feel so encouraged with these uh, men without chests in our midst, with the time I have left, let's talk about how to confront the culture of death. Um, how do we assert our obligation to uh, have dominion and to be stewards of what God has given us in a time when it feels like the enemy has fortified nearly every defense in his genocidal agenda to lynch God's children in the womb. Well, firstly, we must know what we believe, we must know what we're facing, and we must know what to do. So, what do we believe? I'm not going to take too much time on this because I took too long in the first half of the talk, 
Um, but if you want to get a pro-life apologetics training uh, fire hose, just go subscribe to my podcast, Unaborted, with Seth Gruber, because we're all unaborted. Okay, subscribe, leave us five stars. It really helps us reach more people. We appreciate it. It's like Reagan said. I've noticed everyone who's for abortion has already been born. Um, so that's why the podcast is called Unaborted. So every pro-choicer is very grateful that her mother was not exercising her right to choose, right? Kind of their acknowledgement that the person you are now is the same person that you were in the womb. Very interesting. But why is knowing what we believe so important? Because I don't think that Tim Keller and these other woke pastors really believe in the personhood of unborn babies. But don't worry, they tell us they do, so you can trust them, right? They say they're pro-life. What I'm about to say, these pastors would say they agree with. From the moment of conception, there's a distinct living and whole human being. They would say, yes, I agree with that. Then why don't you demand the same political solutions for the lynching of unborn humans that you do for the lynching of born humans? I think your, un your unequal application of your moral solution reveals your more deeply held premise that, to quote Hadley Arcus, these people are not possessed of a lively sense that there are real human beings getting killed in these surgeries. Because if you were possessed of that lively sense, that every day over 3,000 children had their limbs ripped off of their body, if you were possessed of that sense, you would be just as involved in protecting the unborn as you claim you would if you lived in 1850. Right, we all tell ourselves that. Oh, me and Harriet Tubman, we would have been BFFs. Right, like, I would have been underground railroading it so hard, you would have never met a more BA abolitionist. It's like, well, dude, your silence on the genocide of babies today kind of tells me how neutral and silent you would have been on slavery. Do you see what I mean? So it's so important to know what we believe because I don't actually think these appease the culture Christians believe what we believe when we say what we believe. And we believe what Dr. Fauci says, to follow the science. <laughs> science is a sticker that the secular progressive movement slaps over their bigotry to disguise their true agenda and keep the American public confused. Because you can't weed your way through the science and the facts and the data. You're such a rube and you don't understand it. Science is a sticker to justify their apathy. Ironically, we do believe in the science. The baby from conception is distinct because it could be a different gender than mom. It has its own DNA code and it could have a different blood type. Uh, women don't have male and female genitalia. Did you know this? It's crazy. So if a mo mother is pregnant with a preborn male, uh, that means the baby is not your body. The body in your body is not your body. The baby's living because dead things don't grow. Isn't that crazy? Sci very sciencey. And the unborn child meets all the requirements for a living thing that we learned in sixth grade biology. And the unborn child is directing their own internal growth from within. So pregnant moms don't rub their belly and say, don't forget to grow today, baby. The baby's developing themselves. So they're living. And they're whole. A whole human being is simply one who already has everything they need to realize their full growth and development as one of us. Like a Polaroid photo, when you take it and it spits out, the sunrise might not be there immediately, but it has everything it needs to realize its full level of development from the moment it gets spit out, even if you can't see the photo yet. Similarly, you already had everything you needed to realize your full growth and development as a participating member of the human species from conception, even if we couldn't see you yet, you also just needed time. Hashtag science. So that's what we believe. But I'm not convinced that Tim Keller, Ed Stetzer, Russell Moore, Rick Warren actually believe in the science because if they were possessed of a lively sense that that's a pre-born person who's being knit together by the creator of the universe from the moment of conception, they would be more involved in defending that victim than they claim they would be to defend the slave. Because while slavery is a disgusting stain on the history of this country, we lynch more unarmed black lives every two weeks in the womb than the KKK lynched in a century. From a pure body count calculation, abortion is a significant significantly greater form of evil than slavery ever was. And their silence tells us that they don't actually believe this. Secondly, to confront the culture of death, we have to know what we're facing. This is very important. Brothers and sisters, we're not facing an alternative politics, we're facing an alternative religion. Man is fundamentally a religious being. To quote Cardinal Manning, all human conflict is ultimately theological. All these political disagreements, they get down to more deep spiritual theological disagreements. Like what is man? What is woman? What does it mean to be a human? What are rights? Where do rights come from? Why should I respect your rights? These are deeply theological questions, and they undergird seemingly political disagreements. So I always call secular progressivism an alternative religion, and these appease the culture Christians do not understand that this is just not an alternative political ideology available to Americans. It's an alternative religion and a false religion at that. 
a false religion that participates in human sacrifice, the sacrifice of children to pagan gods with the belief that their lives will be improved or that they'll get to live a little bit longer. This is what we need to understand. And secular progressivism is based on an old heresy called Gnostic dualism or body self-dualism. The church has declared this a heresy for centuries. What is Gnostic or body self-dualism? Uh, essentially that the body is bad, the physical is really bad and evil, and real persons are not bodies, real persons are thoughts, consciousness, aims, desires. So in other words, Brian here, right, wonderful MC for the conference, go give him a bear hug afterwards, he loves to give bear hugs. When you give Brian a bear hug, guess what, you didn't hug Brian. No, I know, I know, listen to me, you're not woke, you don't understand, let me explain it to you. You see, Brian is not a body, he, he, the real Brian is a soul, so it's, it's his desires, his self-awareness, his consciousness. So you've never hugged your mother, okay? Um, also, you can't solve a multiple personality disorder because that would be genocide, because each personality would be a different person with different thoughts, aims, and desires. So this is where body self-dualism leads, by the way, okay? Yep. Um, also, your body existed before you did because you had a body in the womb, but it wasn't a person yet because you didn't have these cognitive abilities that you could immediately exercise in the moment, and that's what grounds personhood. Make sense? Welcome to UC Berkeley, guys. <laughs> so this is called body self-dualism, and this is what undergirds abortion. Do you see it? Because the baby hasn't realized certain cognitive functions or abilities that the left says you have to meet to be a person. You can be a human non-person. Yep, not all humans are persons. Not all humans are persons. That sounds like Dred Scott. Right, that sounds like the same exact worldview, that some humans are not persons, and the high priests of secular progressivism, they get to decide the litmus, check, the litmus test and checkbox for personhood. It sounds deeply religious to me. It also sounds like a false religion. <laughs> so you need to understand we're not contending against an alternative politics, we're contending against an alternative religion. So then they say, you know, the baby's not self-aware, they're not conscious, they don't have desires, they can't feel pain, right? I could give you examples of born people who don't yet have desires, who are not yet self-aware, who can't feel pain. So the Gnostic dualism, alternative religion of secular progressivism, ends up justifying the slaughter of born people as well, who would also fail to meet the same less litmus test for personhood. Welcome to La La Land, welcome to secular progressivism. I won't dive too much more into that, go subscribe to the podcast, Unaborted with Seth Gruber, we debunk all these stupid asinine ideas. But we're facing an alternative religion, and not just is that, brothers and sisters, we're actually facing Satan's sacrament. The sacrament of secular progressivism. Now, some of you are like, what a freaking weirdo. He's talking about sacraments and leftism. Seth, it's an atheist movement. Okay, it's not religious. They don't have sacraments. No, of course they do. Man is fundamentally a religious being. You've got to serve someone. Abortion is the high sacrament of secular progressivism because abortion says, you must die so I can live. But Christ says, no, I must die so you can live. Peter Kreft, the Catholic philosopher, put it perfectly when he said that abortion is the demonic parody of the Eucharist. That's why it uses the same holy words. This is my body, but with the opposite blasphemous meaning. So Christ says, this is my body broken for you, take and eat in remembrance of the King of Kings. The culture of death says, no, this is my body, my choice. And I'll kill whatever's inside of my body because the serpent told me in Genesis 3, I shall be as gods. And a god gets to decide who lives and who dies. A god also gets to live forever, which is why with abortion we kill babies to get their embryonic stem cells and their fetal tissue to perform experiments to extend our own lives. The baby simply becomes a sacrifice on man's pursuit of eternal life. Listen to me, brothers and sisters, abortion is the pagan replacement for the pursuit of eternal life. This is Satan's pride and joy. It's his high sacrament, and he's always been behind the killing of babies, hasn't he? Isn't he the dragon in Revelation waiting for Mary to give birth to eat the Christ? Isn't he behind Herod killing babies in Bethlehem and Pharaoh killing babies in Egypt? Doesn't Christ enter a time in which politicians are killing baby to protect political power? Now babies are being born in society where politicians kill babies to protect political power. Abortion is the high sacrament of secular progressivism. So when woke pastors say, I don't get political to protect my witness. No, you don't preach against false religion. That masquerades as politics because the left knows how much cowardly and politically impotent pastors hate the word politics. Brothers and sisters, the left knows this. They know how much pastors hate being associated with politics, so they'll redefine an actual genocidal agenda as just, 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 it's just politics, just politics. Separation of church and state, shut up. Just politics. Because they know that those pastors will fold like a cheap suit at the one moment they're needed the most. We must know what we're facing. And lastly, we must know what to do. 
Daniel's gonna share later about what Love Life does to end abortion as the church unified under a common banner to end the genocide of baby image bearers, but I would just leave you with Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. A lawyer comes to Jesus and says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Is that an important question, by the way? And Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength to love your neighbor as yourself. Boom! I know my Bible, Jesus. I have an MDiv. And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Isn't it nice when God tells you your theology is correct? But he, desiring to, there it was, justify himself said to Jesus, uh, and who is my neighbor? Dude, you don't know who your neighbor is? You just summarized all the law and the prophets down to two commandments in a stroke of theological brilliance, and God said, good job. And now you don't have the same theological clarity to answer the much more simple question, who is my neighbor? Guys, give him some grace, okay? The lawyer probably just forgot who his neighbor was. He's probably just like, Jesus, I'm so perfect and overflowing with righteous love, bro, that I just want to love all neighbors because I'm such a good Christian man. And so can you just remind me who my neighbor is? Was that why he asked the question, and who is my neighbor? No, you see, the lawyer is trying to define some people as his neighbor and some as not his neighbor. He's trying to create categories of neighbor here and non-neighbor here in order to shirk himself of his responsibility of loving the neighbors that he doesn't want to, that are inconvenient and painful to love. There is no other class of human beings alive today to whom the question is more frequently directed, are they really neighbors though? Than the pre-born image bearers in our midst. Nobody gets that question asked of them more. Are they really though? Are they really neighbors? Are they really persons? Are they really like us though? Do they really deserve the same political solutions as the black man? No human being gets that question asked of them more than pre-born children. And unfortunately, that question or assumption, are they really neighbors, is often coming from the pulpits of America. And in response to the question, and who is my neighbor? Jesus tells a story. A story about a man who got beaten up and mugged and robbed and left half dead on the side of the road. But don't worry, the pastor showed up. Praise God, right? The religious leaders, the Levite and the priest. So he's saved, right? Because who better to love a neighbor than those who have been redeemed by God and serve God and know that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor? And they walked by on the other side of the road. Rather than going out of their way to love their bleeding neighbor, they went out of their way to avoid loving their bleeding neighbor. It was the good Samaritan, the bleeding victim's natural enemy, because remember, Jews and Samaritans hated one another, who when he saw his bleeding neighbor, did he feel compassion? The Levite and the priest might have felt compassion. The Levite and the priest were probably anti-street mugging in their personal lives. No, the Good Samaritan, what does Luke's gospel say? He showed, had, those words are action, confronting, had compassion. He bandaged his wounds, he pours on oil and wine, he puts them on his own donkey, he takes him back to an inn, he nurses him back to health, and then he tells the innkeeper, I'm gonna go, but when I come back, I'm gonna cut you a check for any of the costs that accumulated in caring for this bleeding victim while I was gone. Radical sacrifices of his time, his energy, and his money to love his neighbor. And in response to the question, how do I get to heaven, God? And who is my neighbor? That's the story Jesus chooses to tell. He doesn't tell a story about a Levite and a priest who say, repent for the kingdom of God is near, because my only job is evangelism. No, because the gospel means more than just proclaiming the gospel. It means living the gospel. And part of living the gospel means loving your neighbor. And when your neighbor is half dead on the side of the freaking road, you should save his life. We have been driving by and walking by on the other side of the road where we know our neighbors are having their limbs ripped off of their body and murdered at the tune of 3,000 a day in this country, but we're under the tyranny of the urgent because we have more spiritual things to do, just like the Levite and the priest who are probably heading to the synagogue on Friday night to prep their sermon the next morning. There is no other class of human beings alive today to whom the question is more frequently directed, are they really neighbors? And that question comes from Tim Keller, it comes from Rick Warren, it comes from Ed Stetzer, it comes from Russell Moore, who all give spiritual license to their congregations to vote for the very people lynching our neighbors in the womb. They appease the culture in order to get the tithes from their congregants who still vote Democrat because they don't want to offend their political sensibilities and compromise their bottom line. Let's call this idol for what it really is. For 49 years, the American church has been walking by on the other side of the road, and we look at our bleeding unborn neighbors and we say, 
I'm pro-life. While they bleed out and have their limbs dumped into a hazardous waste container that then gets shipped away or sold to labs or to the FDA to have their body parts and organs harvested and chopped up in order to perform experiments to extend our own lives. And we say that we confront the culture. The wonderful truth is that we're actually missing the greatest adventure. By appeasing the culture, we're missing out on the most fun thing of all, saying yes to God and experiencing the adventure of simply being used as a tool in his toolkit to accomplish his purposes on this world. Confronting the culture is simply put to be a Christian. Pray with me, brothers and sisters. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that you entered human history as a zygote, a fetus, an embryo to identify with us from our most vulnerable stage, therefore declaring life to be valuable at every point that we're a human being. Thank you for knitting us together in our mother's wombs. Our frame was not hidden from you when we were woven together in the dark of the earth. You saw our unformed substance before one of our days came to be. Thank you for making us so wonderfully complex. Thank you that you are the creator and lover of life and give us the courage in this moment to step out and be used, not wait to feel burdened, not wait to feel called Called, but to be obedient and experience that, oh, I've actually been called to be obedient, to obey your commandments first and watch how we're used. Use us in this season to take back spiritual ground as your sons and daughters against the sacrament of your greatest enemy, that serpent, that Satan who's obsessed with killing babies. Use us to go to the dark places and bring the light and the salt of the gospel to win back this culture for you as stewards, honoring you with what you've given us. And thank you for the people here today. We pray this in your name. Amen.